Thank you for joining us for another online sermon from Redeemer. From Acts 4, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. This is the word of God. You may be seated. There's a story about a small town that historically had been dry. No liquor sold in that store, in that uh, town. And one day, a uh, local businessman decided to build a tavern. That didn't go off very well with the church because that tavern was going to be built right across the street from the church. So the church planned an all-night prayer meeting. They prayed all night that somehow uh, God would not allow that bar, that tavern, to be in their town. Well, it just so happened, shortly after that prayer meeting, lightning struck the bar and burned it to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church, claiming that the prayers of the congregation caused their church or their bar to be destroyed. The church hired a lawyer arguing that they were not responsible. The presiding judge, after initially reviewing the case, stated that no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The tavern owner believes in prayer and the Christians do not. Well, we believe in prayer because prayers are sprinkled all the way through Scripture. We know there's all kinds of prayers throughout the Old Testament. In fact, there's an entire book that's filled with prayers. You know what that is, the Psalms. Then Jesus certainly believed in prayer, prayed in the morning, evening, sometimes all night. And in the book of Acts, as the church begins, there's prayers and throughout the New Testament. Prayers are vital. The background of the first prayer in the book of Acts is that Peter and John have healed a lame man, and that healing is a springboard to proclaiming the gospel. People gather around because this lame man had been healed. Peter and John proclaim the good news of a Savior, and a couple of thousand people come to faith. The religious leaders are upset. Why? Because Peter and John have just proclaimed that Jesus, the guy they crucified, was the real Messiah and has risen from the dead and is involved in this healing. It's really Jesus that healed through the, through the disciples. And the religious leaders are thinking, boy, that... We sure hope that wasn't the Messiah, because if that was the Messiah, we just, we botched up royally. We have uh, committed a really huge blunder if we killed the Messiah. So Peter and John are thrown into jail, and a meeting is called to decide how to handle this situation. The Sanhedrin, the high court, the supreme court of the Jews is called together along with the high priest and his family. There's probably 70 or 80 in attendance. Their goal is to intimidate Peter and John so they quit preaching about the Messiah. So Peter and John are finally brought in front of the leaders and Peter is not intimidated. You know why? He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He lets God take over his words. And his defense is great. I'll summarize it to you. Peter essentially says, let me get this straight. You guys are mad because we did a kind thing by healing somebody? It's a good thing we didn't do something really bad like spit on the sidewalk or something. 
But we didn't heal anybody. Jesus did the healing. The Messiah. The guy you crucified. God raised him from the dead. And by the way, he's the only way to heaven. Let's read this powerful verse together. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Peter makes it crystal clear. Faith in Jesus, the guy you crucified, is the only way to heaven. Peter might as well have said to the religious leaders, you think there are other ways, but you're wrong. Good works won't get you to heaven. Being a descendant of Abraham won't get you to heaven. Being more holy than everybody else won't get you to heaven. Uh, uh, being religious leaders won't get you to heaven. The gold standard for getting to heaven is Jesus, the guy you crucified. The religious leaders are shocked at how Peter had just spoken to them. And they notice six things. Four things make them angry, and two things make them hesitant. We'll put them up on the screen. Here's what the religious leader saw that made them angry. The courage of Peter and John to speak so rudely to them. And then that they were unschooled. Hicks from Galilee. How can they tell us anything? And then they were ordinary, not the kind of pedigree that these religious leaders had. And then they had been influenced by Jesus, that false Messiah. So why didn't they put them back in jail? Well, two things made them hesitant. One, the healed man is standing there probably doing jumping jacks to show how well his legs had healed. And hundreds of people are praising God for this wonderful miracle. So the religious leaders confer. Gentlemen, we're between a rock and a hard place, and the rock is bigger than the rock of Gibraltar. We can't deny what's happening. Look at that lame man, he, he, he's running around. Things are getting out of hand. So the religious leaders decide to take some action and threaten James and John to, to keep them quiet. But they really don't have much force behind their words. They basically some, say something like this, you just better not do it again. And Peter and John replied, who do you think we should obey? God or you guys? And the religious leaders are kind of stuck they really can't arrest Peter and John, and you know why? The crowd is all around them cheering and praising God for this wonderful miracle. Well, I've re reviewed this story in somewhat of a lighthearted fashion, but the disciples are in real danger. The authorities could come at night, and Peter and John really show some courage. So they are released. And the Bible says they go to their own people. Who are their own people? It's the born-again crowd. It's, it's a new form of humanity called the body of Christ. It's people like us who have received Christ as Savior. And Peter and John give a full report. The Supreme Court of the Jews have handed down a decree that we are not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore and they threatened us. So what should they do? Well, how about prayer? That's what they did. They prayed. And so we have the very first prayer of the early church. Here's how it starts. Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. They recognize that God is in charge and has everything under control. Boy, that's a good way to start our prayers. The implication for the disciples was if God is the creator, 
It stands to reason that God can control his creation. All these threats and uh, 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 persecutions from the religious leaders will not stop their proclaiming the good news. And the implication for us is because our God created the universe, he certainly can deal with any problems we might be facing. Can he answer my prayers? Are you kidding? He created the universe. The prayer continues as a reminder that Good Friday was clearly prophesied. You know, when the disciples were going through Good Friday, they thought everything was our control. But they began to recognize through Old Testament prophecy that all of this was planned. The Old Testament scripture, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Nothing that happened on Good Friday was by accident. God was in control. It was all part of God's plan. If God could plan something like that with exact detail, he certainly can plan our lives and even bring good out of our worst moments. The prayer continues as a reminder of how that prophecy was carried out. It's up on the screen, verses 27 and 28, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. It had all been planned. The, the non-Jews plotted, Herod plotted, Pontius Pilate plotted, the religious leaders plotted, and they thought they got one over on Jesus. He's on the cross. God, we pulled the wool over your eyes. But God says, you played right into my hands. I knew it all along. The death of my son was predestined to take place. So what do we learn about prayer? Knowing that God is creator and has everything under control, we are to pray with confidence. Confidence that God is in charge, that he has a plan, that he is accomplishing his plan, that he's the creator. He prophesied Good Friday. He has everything under control. Knowing that God is creator and has everything under control, we are to pray with courage. Verse 29, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. I think that's an amazing prayer because that's not the way I would have prayed. Yeah, if I'd have been back at that time, I would have said, Lord, deal with your enemies. Get them out of the way so that I can be safe when I walk the streets and proclaim the good news of a Savior. Put your angels around me to protect me. I don't want to proclaim your word unless it's safe. It's kind of the way I think sometimes. But amazingly enough, the disciples don't pray that way. They say... Uh, uh, they pray that even with the persecution, that they would have the courage to simply proclaim the good news in the midst of those difficult times, to be bold and not fold. Did God like that prayer? Verse 31, and when they, had, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Maybe the shaking was an earthquake, or maybe God just shook their, their house to show that he put his stamp of approval on that prayer. And maybe this should be our daily prayer. Let's pray it together. God, you are the creator. I confidently know that you can handle anything I'm facing today. Give me the courage to stand up for you and speak up for you and trust you in everything. You know, it's interesting to me that most of the prayers in the New Testament emphasize the spiritual. 
I kind of skim through many of the prayers in the New Testament, and there's hardly any prayers asking for help in a crisis or for healing. For example, Philippians, first chapter has a long prayer, and the prayer in the prayer, Paul prays uh, thanksgiving for their faith. He prays that they might grow in their faith. He prays that they would have more wisdom. He prays that they would live holy lives. He prays that they would glorify God. That's how many of the prayers go through the New Testament. And Paul is writing to people who are having all kinds of crises and challenges in their lives, but the prayers are almost all for spiritual strength. Isn't that interesting? So I ask myself, do I mostly pray to be spared from trouble, or do I pray that no matter what troubles I face, that I will reflect my faith in Jesus by how I handle those problems? The truth is, praying to be spared from trouble is natural. In fact, the Bible teaches that we should call on God in the day of trouble. When our health fails, when finances become tight, when there's a family member in a crisis, of course we should come to the Lord in prayer. But those kinds of prayers should not be the main prayers that we have, at least according to the prayers in the New Testament. In Mark Twain's classic Huckleberry Finn, Huck and the slave Jim are rafting down the Mississippi River. Then there's a terrible storm. And, the, and Jim says to Huck, do you think we ought to pray? And Huck says, it ain't bad enough yet. And I like the deacon who came to his pastor with a problem. Pastor said, I guess all we can do is pray. The deacon said, has it come to that? Each of us, as we mature as a disciple, we'll find ourselves praying more and more for spiritual matters in our lives and in the lives of others, for the advance of the gospel and for the growth of the church. Our principle on the screen, pray about anything and everything, but emphasize the spiritual. God, give me the confidence to know that you are in charge and the courage to serve you no matter what that I might act like a child of the King of Kings in every circumstance of my life. We pray that you are inspired by this message. Please join us again next week for another online sermon from Redeemer. 